there we go. Um, and I am going to give that just a minute to settle itself because it also often does a bit of tinkering with the internet signal while it's just settling into its recording. So, OK, um, so a, a, a little bit of a welcome for me. So uh, I, I, I was going to say I, I know most people on screen. I do know most either faces or names, um, but it's really lovely to see so many people on today's session. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first in our webinar programme where we are talking about the business links between Scotland and Sweden. Um, I'm going to butcher Skåne and Olaf and hope that I have heard Ingela say it enough times. <laughs> and she laughs because um, our household is prone to watching quite a bit of Scandi Noir, so I can also say absolute like a pro, and mm. that's about as much as I'm doing. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so I am Alison Henderson. I'm CEO at Dundee and Angus Chamber of Commerce, and our international team do an amazing job of supporting our businesses, not just in our part of the world, but in, in Scotland, in doing their international trade and we just did a team session at lunchtime there where the international team were talking about our export documentation service and the customs service that we do but another really important part of our work is helping building international connections and that's all about exploring other markets new markets to scottish businesses or widening connections in in countries where maybe people are, are already doing a little bit of trade or are interested in establishing a base so um, Ingela and Emma and Amber and Simone and the international team have been um, looking at lots of different markets and, and this is the first um, in this half of the year where we're going to be building international markets with Sweden. Coming up is also um, some work that we're going to do with Finland and then later on this year we'll be talking about the Netherlands and Dubai and just exploring some other connections. But it's really great then that we've got to this stage and, and hugely important in all of that work is establishing the right partnership and um, Olaf, we couldn't be doing this without the support of your organisation. Uh, it's brilliant. So uh, we will kind of talk later on in the, the session today about our upcoming in-person mission. So we will be in Sweden in the middle of September. I will tell you a little bit more about that later on. But today is very much about us hearing about um, Invest in Skåne in Olaf and the colleagues he has um, got who are going to come on today and tell you all about doing business in Sweden and why it's absolutely something either you should consider yourself or you should tell everybody you know. Um, so Olaf, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Alison. And without further ado, I'll actually share my screen and we'll get started right away. Uh, it is a it is a packed program uh, and I hope uh, you'll all find it very interesting. So uh, welcome to Skåne. Uh, this I think you should all see my screen. Uh, the red the red square is there, so I hope it's it's uh, shown correctly. My name is Olof Tedin and I work as a business developer and investment promotion uh, agent for the southernmost region of Skåne, uh, which is this part uh, in the on the world map. It's a very, very small peninsula in the southernmost part of Sweden. Uh, but we are we are quite local, but we are also quite international and hopefully by the end uh, of these two days you will understand why. My role here today is to present a very, uh, very bird's eye view of the region and uh, give you some of the areas of strength that we're working with. Uh, and but I won't go into detail about those because they will tell them uh, they will tell you themselves who they are and what they do and what uh, role they have in the southern Sweden ecosystem. So um, the geography here, uh, we're part uh, in southern Sweden and Skåne is part of the Greater Copenhagen area, which is uh, a geographical area containing about four and a half million people and uh, between Copenhagen or Denmark and, and southern Sweden connected by the Öresunds Bridge. And uh, you mentioned uh, Scandinavian Noir. Uh, so the bridge is of course one of the, the hallmarks for what's going on in the region. But it, Skåne is not just good for murder, uh, it is actually quite good for business as well. 
um, but also in Sweden in general. Uh, Sweden ranks very highly on a lot of different indices uh, across across the globe. Everything from innovation to work-life balance to uh, network readiness, uh, talent, you name it, and we're probably among the top five in a lot of these different areas. And one of the reasons why Sweden ranks very high on this is actually because of Skåne. So that moves us into Skåne's strengths and positions that is going on here in the region. So I'll briefly mention all of these. Uh, the strategic location, our role as an innovation leader, access to the talent pool that we have, uh, the collaborative ecosystem, and exceptional quality of life. So starting off uh, with this uh, zoom in of the region, uh, the dark gray area on the right is of course Skåne and then uh, you have Copenhagen and Denmark on the left. So by, I mentioned earlier that we're quite local but also very international and that is primarily due to the Copenhagen airport. So it's actually easier to travel to Copenhagen and take the bridge over to Malmö and, and the rest of Skåne than flying anywhere else if you wish to vis visit us. And when you're actually in Malmö, you can go to almost anywhere in within the rest of the region uh, with car or by train within one hour. So you have an amazing ecosystem uh, at the touch of your fingertips, basically. And, and this is also the gateway to the rest of the, uh, the Nordics uh, and Scandinavia, but also Europe, if you want to travel further down south. Um, this is a very much um, a logistical hub, uh, both in uh, air, uh, shipping and rail and by, by truck. So if, you, if you're looking for a place to establish a node for logistics, Skåne is also a very good place for that in terms of uh, in, in company to a lot of other things. Uh, Skåne is an innovation leader. There is, nothing, uh, there is nothing to hide about that. We have some of the best universities. Lund University, of course, is one of the highest ranked in the world or top 100. Uh, we have some fascinating uh, research and uh, innovation facilities, but we also work, uh, work quite a lot in triple helix and quadru quadruple helix structures, meaning that we work with public innovation or uh, public organizations, uh, academia, private sector and other actors as well to bring either uh, academic research into uh, groundbreaking products and uh, uh, or other areas. And this is something that we have done for a long time. Here is a very short and very small uh, slice of what we have been doing uh, in Skåne throughout the years. I think most of you are, uh, are familiar with some of these names. Others are more more or less obscure, but Tetra Pak is, of course, a big, a big part. The first milk carton, uh, Bluetooth, I think is something is almost everything that uh, something that we use all of us every every day. Um, Oatly, which has been making waves quite well, relatively uh, recently, but they actually started in the 1990s. Uh, facial recognition and uh, technology for the iPhone, for instance, was also partially developed here in Skåne. And these are just a few examples. There's way, way, way more that uh, some of some of the people who will be presenting will actually uh, give you an idea for. This innovation uh, has, of course, led to a lot of international interest, but also local local growth. So here are some examples of the local uh, local and global HQs and research and development based uh, in Skåne, primarily around uh, Malmö, Lund and Helsingborg, which is the three largest cities. But this is, of course, not all of them, but I think and I hope that you recognize uh, a few of the logos here on screen, at least. And anyone who is part of this ecosystem here in southern Sweden have fairly fairly good chances to reach out and speak to these actors themselves. Um, this is of course of, uh, so all of the companies uh, mentioned before and and the innovation system that has been come growing out of the soil here in southern Sweden uh, is in some way or other connected either to the university or any of the innovation support systems with science and technical parks, incubators, accelerators and innovation support ecosystem and infrastructure. So there is uh, 10 or uh, more than 10 actually uh, of these various institutions and organizations spread without uh, within Skåne. 
And some of them are technology agnostic, uh, like Idea on Science Park. Uh, others are way more specific, like, for instance, Medicon Valley uh, Village uh, that will present tomorrow, I believe. Uh, but also um, you have incubators and hubs where as long as you have an idea, you're welcome to explore it together with their with their ecosystem. And this, of course, creates a very, very strong entrepreneurial ecosystem and, and growth platform for a lot of these businesses. Uh, so you can be either very specific or you can be quite broad in your approach. Uh, so here are some other examples. Uh, Mobile Heights will present as well uh, tomorrow. Game Habitat is directly after me, which is the game development uh, cluster. And uh, Food Tech Innovation Network will also present today. Clean Tech Scandinavia is also part of the program today. So depending on what you're into, there is certainly an ecosystem for you here in southern Sweden to, to explore and, and connect with. Um, of course, most of the most of the groundwork for this is, of course, in the universities and institutions that we have here in southern Sweden. So Lund University, Malmö University, uh, the Swedish University for Agricultural uh, Research and uh, World Maritime University is part uh, some uh, some of the uh, parts of the ecosystem here as well, which produces a lot of talent, of course, for the companies, but also they do a lot of their own research that is then spun out into new companies um, that, that exist in the ecosystem today. Part of this uh, is, of course, Max4 and European Spallation Source. I won't go too much into detail about these because they will also be presenting tomorrow in the first session, I believe it is. Uh, but Mac, I'll just a brief overview is that Max4 Laboratories is a na Swedish national research facility uh, that it uses an, a very powerful X-ray, you could say, uh, to do a lot of research within material science and food and, and, and so forth. And then we have the European Spallation Source, or ESS, which is a combination uh, or a collaboration between 17 different European countries uh, that is co that is hosted primarily by Sweden with the facility, but the data center is located in Copenhagen. And this is also a type of microscope that uses a neutron source. Uh, they work very closely together in order to bring all of the uh, all of the uh, potential that these two research facilities can bring to the rest of the world. Uh, but I'll let uh, Emily Hilner, which is the communications uh, manager for, for Max4, uh, showcase that for to you tomorrow. Um, this is, of course, of course, uh, a ground groundwork for all the all the talent that we have in the region. Uh, we have, I think it is somewhere around uh, 17 universities in the greater Copenhagen region. So that includes Skåne and the eastern part of Denmark. Um, a lot of students every year, uh, bachelor, masters, doctors, graduates, um, go from a variety of the industries that you saw before, uh, material science, food, uh, technology, IT, ICT, whatever, and technology-based uh, STEM research, basically, uh, are readily available in, in the ecosystem. But we also have other specialized talents for, for instance, the game developer community here, which is quite dense compared to other, other areas. Uh, this figure here is actually uh, incorrect. We are actually more than 1,500 developers to date, and we're aiming to be more than 5,000 by 2030. Uh, the collaborative ecosystem, uh, that this is something that we believe very strongly in here in southern Sweden and in Sweden in gel, uh, general. So we work a lot within the uh, quadruple helix approach of strong academic foundation, cross-sector collaboration between academia, industry, government and civil society. Um, and this is, of course, helped along with having large international uh, corporations, a ground, uh, re uh, cutting edge research ecosystem but also having a region that is quite open to testing new things. Uh, and that goes even for the inhabitants that live here. We're very curious about new technology. We're curious about new products. We're cu uh, curious about new services. So for anyone who is looking for, for test markets for new products, Scandinavia and the Nordics, and especially Sweden, is quite a good place to start because we are quite open to, to new things. Um, and it's quite easy to get in touch with any of these ecosystems if you want to do collaborations. 
um, either go through us or any of the other uh, ecosystems man, uh, partners that we showed you before, and they will quite happily uh, set you up with anyone who is uh, like minded to you in, in looking to explore what you're doing. Exceptional qual quality of life. Um, Skåne and Sweden in general, we are very keen on um, on keeping work and life separated, at least uh, if we so wish. Um, and Skåne, we pride ourselves especially on this, uh, but we because we are again local, but also quite international. If you live in Malmo, you can take uh, the train to to Copenhagen in twenty minutes, and you can have the big city feel. Uh, the capital city feel. You can also go to the airport and go anywhere within in Europe within a couple of hours. But you can also go out into the countryside and have uh, uh, do a hike, or you can go to the beach. You can go to the forest, and we're quite keen on preserving this balance between uh, the urban and and um, and the rural in terms of doing what we what we want to do in these areas and these constellations. So the focus areas and all of the things that I've been speaking to, uh, speaking to you about uh, earlier uh, boils down into these uh, five industry ecosystems or e uh, segments, and of course the ASS and Max4. They are a bit separate; uh, they, they're not industry per se, but they are a very important part of the ecosystem that we work with. Um, I won't go into too much detail about all what all of these categories uh, explain or what they contain because they are quite broad. But tech uh, is is uh, is a very broad category. It could include be included in all of the others. But uh, a brief rundown of some of the categories we have within tech is 5G, 6G development, AI, image recognition, sensors, software, game development, and uh, and and a few others as well. In life science, we're very big on um, uh, biotechnology, cancer and uh, diabetes research, for instance. We're also strong in life uh, med tech and, and uh, health tech. Uh, we're actually one of the nodes for something, an ecosystem called Health Tech Nordic, which is uh, a collaboration between all the Nordic countries within the, uh, within the health tech sector. Food uh, is something that has been in part of the soil uh, of Skåne, if you excuse the pun, uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, it's actually 30 to 50 percent of all foodstuffs consumed in Sweden has, has its origin in Skåne in some way or another. And this, of course, have led to a large ecosystem within food development culture. Uh, Lund University, for instance, have an entire faculty, faculty dedicated to food development and, and food chemistry. Uh, and this is something that we're bringing further now with the green revolution or the sustainability aspect that people are considering within food. Uh, we also have a packaging cluster very closely related to food and of course with the life science spectrum. ASS and MAX4, uh, I won't go too much into detail about that here, but uh, it's very closely linked to the advanced materials and manufacturing industry. Since we have so much uh, cutting edge innovation and, and talented individuals, we work a lot with uh, nanomaterials, nanoprocessing, uh, advanced bio coatings, chemical coatings and so forth, but also in the, in the mass production of these, of these things to prototype or or find out uh, how it could be taken to to a grander scale and affect lives in uh, prom promote uh, sustainable business and so forth and then of course smart sustainable cities which includes uh, a lot of the things that I've mentioned already but it has everything from to do with energy solutions to um, uh, energy solutions to how to facilitate uh, green cities, uh, urban farming, uh, better health care, better mobility in cities and so forth. So we have a lot to offer in this space as well. Uh, and that brings us to what it is that actually invest in school and it does, uh, because it's not it's not necessarily shown by just a name. We do uh, work a lot with uh, investment promotion, of course, uh, but it's, that is not all. We uh, we work primarily in three legs. We have export promotion, and uh, uh, which is of course for our local companies, but it also includes international companies with subsidiaries here in Skåne. We can help them as well. Um, 
but in the investment promotion services are usually this is not all the categories, but there's some of them. Establishment services, market and industry opportunities, analysis and so forth, innovation and talent scouting, site selection and expansion services. The second leg uh, is exports that I briefly mentioned, but uh, we work with a lot with a European uh, enterprise European network, which is a European uh, project where you help find uh, uh, sourcing companies, manufacturers, uh, customers, so forth. Uh, but we also do our own uh, activities within this space. So these are some of the things that we you can expect if, if you're a local company. And then we also work quite a lot with collaborations and, uh, and partnerships. We don't have a separate slide for that, but if it's related to all of the things that I've dis discussed in, in, in the collaborative ecosystem and finding, uh, finding um, partners, collaborations, uh, either in research or whatever, it might, joint ventures, whatever it might be. And that is uh, the core of what it what it is that we do. And we are a governmental uh, organization. We're public nonprofit, so we don't charge for any of our services, either from local companies or international ones. So uh, if you're interested to know more, these slides of, are, of course, available. This is a short presentation of what it is that we do. We have more to offer, of course, and we have more detailed information about all the ecosystems that we, you can get access to through us as well. Uh, I will close there and I will thank you so much for the attention and if you have any questions feel free to reach out either uh, afterwards or during the in, in physical visit in, in September and with that I thank you for your attention. Thank you Olaf that was fab. Um... You just you also reminded me that I forgot at the very beginning to say about questions. So what we try and do is um, we have got a bit of time if there was anybody had a question for you at the moment. But um, if people just want to drop their questions into the chat and if we've got time, we'll pick them all up at the end. And if we do, we can follow up with people afterwards. But just I know what it's like sometimes it just comes up as, a, as somebody's talking and they may, we might not get time to move into that. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for that. That was super interesting. Um, so we've got our next speaker, um, Peter, I think is, is next up, isn't he? So, um, Peter, it's lovely to see you. Um, and as I say, for, for all the participants, drop your questions into the chat if you get the chance. Um, and Peter, just so that you know, we're recording the session, so we'll put the recording up on the, the Chamber's YouTube channel um, afterwards for people that didn't get a chance to, to kind of come on. So I'm going to get out of the way again. <laughs> um, uh, Olaf, thank you so much. Um, and Peter, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Sure can. Sure can. Perfect. Um, thank you for inviting me. I, I just joined, so I'm, I'm not completely up to speed with what's been said so far, um, but I know Olaf's presentation uh, from before at least. Um, so my name is Peter and I'm the CEO of Game Habitat, which is the, the regional like games association in southern Sweden. And I'm going to share some um, information about uh, sort of games scene here. Um, hopefully I'll be able to share my slides with you. Um, here we go. So I'm going to start by giving just a brief introduction to the Swedish games industry for, for context. So these numbers are from 2021, and uh, so they, it's uh, quite a bit has happened since they were pr produced. But uh, at the end of 2020, there were 650 game companies uh, in Sweden and about 6,500 game developers uh, and an annual turnover of 3.3 billion euros. And of course, Sweden is mainly famous for like games like Minecraft and Candy Crush uh, and Battlefield. Uh, and I'm going to be talking more about the, sort of the regional games that are, are famous uh, coming from our part of Sweden. Uh, but I also want to mention that we've estimated that every eighth person in the world has played a game made in Sweden. So we have quite a, a big reach for a country uh, of our size. And we've seen an immense growth uh, in the games industry for the past 10 years. So just in the from 2010 to 2020, we've 
more than increased the, the turnover by about 35 times. So we had an average annual growth rate of 42 percent. So it's been a, a huge success and it's starting to become one of the new like base industries in Sweden. I think we're now on par with mining, um, ex, uh, like iron ore export and those kind of things. So we've passed them and we're, we're closing in on other like core industries. So it's it's really just in 10 years gone from being very niche to becoming a key player in the Sweden economy. And in terms of employees, it hasn't been growing at the same pace, pace but may, that's mainly because of the lack of talent. Um, so we've grown by 19% average um, the past 10 years. And it's even higher now. I, we're going to get new numbers in the fall. Um, so we'll see uh, just by how much, but nothing uh, is indicating that we're decreasing this growth rate. So then moving on to southern Sweden, um, where we're based and uh, operation operating. Um, so here uh, in Skåne and, and Blekinge, which we also include in our region, we estimate about 100 companies, 10 schools. Um, I'm going to mention some more about that later and about 1600 developers. And for reference, 1600 devs is as many game devs that were uh, working in Denmark, Norway and Iceland combined in 2019. Um, and most of them are based in Malmö, which only has 350,000 inhabitants. So in, in terms of concentration per capita, we have one of the highest um, game devs per capita in Europe. Um, and this is how like so the, the the trajectory we've been on here regionally uh, from 2012 to 2020 we went from 350 people to 1200 and if we keep at that pace until 2030 we estimate that we might be as many as 5000 people working in games in the region and that's uh, also uh, like in the context of being a new sort of core industry or um you know critical industry for the for the city and the region um that's um going to be one of the biggest sectors uh, in in the region by 2030, if we keep at this pace. But none of that is sort of relevant unless we were making good games. At least that's how I think about it. I'm my background is in game development and I've been a passionate gamer my whole life. So um, these are some of the games that have been made here and we don't really have a clear like niche. We make games in every conceivable genre, all the platforms, all the scopes from small like indie games made by one person up to this big blockbuster AAA games um, reaching hundreds of millions of people worldwide. And this is, uh, I want to mention like three of the key success factors. I think all of my have mentioned some of this before, but these are the when we like look back and see well, well, how come we have like reached this success in our region. What are the key factors? And of course, Ubisoft Massive uh, is one of the main uh, drivers of growth because they've been around for 25 years this year actually, uh, and uh, are now 750 people working on some of the biggest IPs in the world. Then we have Nordic Game Conference, which is one of the leading game conferences in Europe, and it's also closing in on 20 years. Uh, and then the Game Assembly, which is um, one of the best game schools in the world. It's been ranked at, as the highest. It's been ranked number two in the like annual um, ranking done by the rookies. Uh, and it's um, it's a very sought after talent um, <laughs> production house in the sense that every year we have like 40 to 50 game companies coming to Malmö just to meet with um, the interns that are about to go out on their internship. So it's a, the, the students from the school is very sought after. So these three, I think, together has really helped us accelerate the growth of our industry. And I also want to mention some of these uh, like indie games that have been as successful and depending on what, what measure you use. But uh, Smash Hit, for example, has been downloaded, I think, uh, upwards of 300 million times. Uh, by now worldwide, and it's was made by just two people in Malmö. Um, Sayonara Wild Hearts uh, was named the best Apple Arcade game in the world, um, also made by a studio of two people with some help from other um, artists. 
And then my Phil Pedro, which uh, is just made by one person and it was uh, a huge success. It sold about 250,000 copies in a week uh, and received multiple awards and been uh, like contacted by uh, people in Hollywood who want to develop the IP for, for television. Um, so it's not only like the AAA style successes, but we also really, uh, really strong in the indie and uh, like independent and small studio scene. So just moving on to Game Habitat, where where I'm uh, working. So we're a community fo focused um, nonprofit. Sometimes we call ourselves a cluster, but it's in usually a cluster consists of um, like companies from a whole sector. And in our sense, it's only games, so it's a bit niche in that sense. But we act as a cluster, and we are member driven. So we have uh, game companies that are members in our nonprofit. And uh, we work with all the stakeholders and um, uh, like from the public sector and the schools and academia, universities. Uh, and the goal is to enable the best environment for game development. And we work a lot with like ecosystem development. So um, and also maybe what differs us from some other organizations is that we work a lot with the software uh, value. So that we, we talk about creating um, like nurturing and growing uh, a thriving and supportive ecosystem for games. Um, so it's a lot about inclusiveness and making people feel welcome and like uh, highlighting sort of quality of life aspects of working in, in the community in our in our region uh, where we think that we are very strong. Um, so maybe we're not really competing on like having the most capital available or having subsidies because we don't have any of those, but we do have a really like a high concentration of, of people, but also really strong culture um, within the game scene. Um, so that's what we're trying to sort of cultivate as an organization. These are our members and uh, what I can say about those, we have about 40 members and it's uh, they represent about 95% of the game developers, the employees in the region. So all the big studios and a lot of the small ones and other support organizations, uh, service providers, the sort of critical mass uh, are members in the organization. Uh, and apart from paying like a membership fee, they support us in, in different ways. Uh, some uh, contribute with more time and some are very active on the board, um, but there, there's a very active community around these uh, companies. And a big part of our funding comes from public funding. So Malmö Stad, the city of Malmö, the municipality, and then the region of Skåne uh, are also all contributing to this idea, uh, along with our private partners like Amazon and uh, SCB and Basikona. To just give you sort of an overview of um, oh, sorry, um, what we what we do. Um, so we we're quite a small organization, but we do a lot of um, different things. So we started out with focusing a lot on community building. So like creating meeting places, uh, doing meetups and talks, workshops, uh, keynotes, those kind of things. Um, and then we've been uh, mainly in form of projects, but also supporting with business development and growth. But we're not an incubator. We're not like an accelerator. We don't have those kind of business development resources. Um, it's more about um, doing things to benefit the community as a whole. And then when we have opportunities to go to conferences and expos um, by means of EU project funding or similar, then the, we are usually the ones organizing the activities. Um, and we also act as sort of an umbrella brand or umbrella vision for the communication of our region as a games region. So what we mean by that is that we have we've developed a communication strategy that we work at both for us as an organization, but we also create things together with um, our members. So right now, yesterday, we actually launched a new campaign video um, that has been uh, the product uh, like a collaboration between all of the studios in the region. So they all submitted content. It was edited by one studio and it was like directed by us. Uh, and that is something we then use to highlight um, the benefits of coming and working uh, in our region. So that's sort of an example of how we drive the regional brand uh, of Southern Sweden as a game region. Um, 
and then uh, we also yeah we do a bunch of different projects and, and programs um, like we do Swedish courses for game developers we do diversity and inclusion activities um, we partner with most of the stakeholders in the region and we also run our own dev hub uh, which is um, a building dedicated to game development in the center of Malmö so we have office space um, for Around 25 companies right now, um, around 150 developers are in the house. So it's five stories in the center of town. As far as we know, it's the biggest uh, like of its kind where you house everything from indie to AAA to investors and publishers in the same house. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's celebrating four years now this month, actually. Um, and uh, it's been a huge uh, part of our success as an organization because it's been a meeting become a meeting place like an, an embassy for the games industry and we have people coming from all over the world to visit Malmö for different reasons and visiting us and they are all usually quite um, uh, amazed by this place because Malmö isn't a huge city but the games industry here is huge and this house is also a very special uh, thing for us so this is how uh, it looks Hopefully you can come visit someday. Um, so we run this as a sort of um, a subsidiary of our nonprofit. So it's its own company, but it's run as a nonprofit where we rent the space from the property owner and then we um, we facilitate and rent out like uh, rooms and desks, uh, have co-working, uh, event space, um, all of those things as a means of driving the growth and driving the community uh, around the games industry in the region. Um, it was a bit of a short run through intro of the things that we do. Uh, so uh, I have plenty of time to answer any questions that you might have, I think, uh, in terms of the schedule. Um, I hope you got something uh, out of this. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to go into more in depth if you want to delve on something. Thank you so Thank much, you. much Peter. Um, yeah, I yeah. don't have any questions, but since we have some time, uh, if there is anyone who, who has any questions or uh, thoughts in regards to game habitat and game development community, uh the floor the floor is open i think um uh, i would like to add something to this uh which i have spoken to with uh ingela uh who is the co-organizer of this from from the aberdeen and and um uh, no i'm not aberdeen uh angus and um dundee side is uh, that invest in Skåne and the region, we also uh, collaborate with Game Habitat uh, and we have an opportunity for game developers and anyone who is related to the games industry actually to come and explore this ecosystem, including in the Game Habitat with a guest office uh, that we are we are sponsoring. So if, if you are really keen on visiting uh, and you don't have potential uh, a, um, ability to join us during the, the visit in September, uh, that is one way to to explore the the ecosystem for up to 90 days uh, without paying any rent in at game habitat and there's a lot of perks and, and stuff surrounding this as well thank you okay. yes lorna i suppose so my question around the um that opportunity that kind of guest office who are you looking for to come and visit game habitat is it academics is it startups is it potential investors just trying to understand who who you would like to be connected with from our side um, obviously Aberty university we do games and we've probably had a hand in a lot of the cluster development in in, in dundee so it's just what can we do that would be helpful for you do you want to answer, Peter, or you can take that? Okay. If you want. Yeah, yeah, I, you you can add something if I if I miss anything. I mean, yeah. this this started out uh, when I started working with the games industry uh, here in in southern Sweden, and in Peter and Game Habitat. We we realized quite quickly, at least in my mind, that we have this fantastic ecosystem, but we have 
I mean, you can only compete so much with traditional, like, I don't know, LinkedIn posts and, and videos on YouTube. So it's nice to do something that's quite unique or hopefully unique. And at the time there was space at Game Habitat. And I thought, what about if we pay for it or we, we do we do the marketing and, uh, and we invite people, anyone basically that's related to the games industry to come and uh, come and have a look at it. And we started out by saying, it should be game developers, uh, so game developers only. But we have quite quickly broadened the approach uh, to say that anyone who is interested in the games industry here in Skåne, it's a is a fantastic place for them to to come and join us and be an ambassador. Uh, when one day once they leave, I mean, hopefully they will be so amazed by this that they relocate instantly. But that is a bit too of a too too um, too much to ask for. So. Anyone who is interested, uh, we have uh, several game developer or, uh, association of organizations in Europe, but also in uh, other parts of the world that has shown interest in, in making use of this space to send uh, developers, uh, small startups, but also uh, bigger studios, investors, publishers and so forth. And we, we so far we haven't said no to anyone yet. Did I did I forget something, Peter? Uh, no, but I can just say like for, for us as an organization, we have like in terms of what we strive for. So right now, our strategic focus are mainly two things. One is to attract more talent and one is to attract um, companies that want to establish themselves here. So in the past five years, we've had five major studios open up um, here in, in Malmö and two of them have started in the dev hub and then scaled up and, and outgrown the space. Um, and I think that's what we ideally want to see is like find companies who are, you know, they're just curious. They might be looking to expand somewhere or set up a satellite somewhere. And then by lowering the, the threshold and then they coming here for three months, we're quite uh, like quite confident that what we have here is something you can't really find anywhere else. And, and the best way to experience that is by to come here yourself and then hopefully that could lead in the long term to more companies wanting to come here and setting up a more like permanent presence. So I think that is the best outcome we could have. But like Olaf is saying, it's really anyone who could benefit from being in the context of um, some of the best game developers in the world that are all in the same house, I think uh, should be uh, looking into this uh, opportunity. In, in terms of talent um, and skills gaps, are there particular areas within the games industry that you're looking for talent? Um, is it artists? Is it designers? Is it producers? Um, or is it, are you experiencing a shortage across the piece? It is across all the disciplines in general, but it's mainly um, about seniority. So that is the challenge. We have a lot of good schools, both like dedicated game schools and university programs, but also, you know, civil engineering, programming and engineering, those kind of programs as well. So there's a lot of talent and in this, the region around Copenhagen and Malmö is, is the most uh, dense uh, in terms of universities anywhere in Europe. Uh, so we have a lot of that kind of talent um, available, but We've already vacuumed all the senior talent in Sweden because of the, the rapid growth. It's really difficult to find senior talent, which is why now I think more than half of everyone, every job that is filled, every position that's filled is someone who's moved here from another country. Mm. Um, and that is, of course, we're doing it, but it's it's very uh, difficult and it takes a lot of resource to to relocate people and find people uh, and of course, also making sure that they really, um, you know, want to stay long term. Um, so I think that's the main thing. It's not necessarily a particular discipline, even though I think it's more heavy on the technical side. Like we have a bigger need or gap in terms of programmers than we have of artists, for example. But it's mainly about seniority of uh, like people with experience from running and delivering at least like one one project that's usually the, the bar like the, that you have been part of the cycle um so yeah thank you we had a question in the chat from from terry uh peter are you looking for game ideas too 
Uh, no, not really. Uh, not we and not really the games companies either, because they're already so preoccupied with delivering and developing the ideas that they have. Um, so usually there, I mean, some people come to us with ideas because they want to realize them and develop them, but they don't know how. And usually that's quite a high uh, threshold to overcome because the main the thing that like ideas in the games industry aren't really worth anything unless you can really um, like develop them yourself or find the means to develop them. So that's the harsh reality of uh, the harsh answer and reality of answer to that question, I would say. And uh, just to add to that as well, it's there is no shortage of ideas and we see a lot of traditional industry, if you want to call it that, both in, in Sweden and overseas that are looking at at the games industry to to disrupt their own industries. So we have questions from our own ecosystems here in, in Skåne uh, towards Game Habitat and Peter and also myself to get to get in touch with with game developers uh, to develop serious games or gamification of services and so forth. So the games industry is definitely growing in in terms of reach, not only in for as a as an entertainment product, but but other areas as well. Yeah, that is a, a bit of a challenge because there is that interest from like other industries to tap into the success of the games industry and try to find a way to increase engagement in their products mm -hmm. or services. Um, it's really difficult to match with the talent or the the competence or like the the companies because they like in terms of the companies that we have here. There are less than five, I would say, that actually do like work for hire and develop other ideas, uh, other companies' ideas, or develop services or games for other companies. Um, and all the rest are making their own games one way or another. Uh, and that is, of course, a testament to the success of the industry. But it's also a bit of um, a bummer in a sense that because there is so much that we could do uh, if we only found the people with like game development um, experience that would also be available and have an interest in contributing to other industries because we could really drive development in those industries. So that is something we're working on trying to figure out how because so far we haven't really uh, been able to find that match. But it's it's part of our mission to try and find that synergy. Simon. I, yeah, I, so just following on from that point um, with the small number of um, game studios that are doing the work for hire. Is that because the ones who are working on their own IP, where are they getting investment from to be able to fully focus on their own IP? Um, I mean, there's so it's quite common that game studios who want to make their own IP have, you know, been working as work for hire, either for other game studios or for other companies. So like we have one example here in the house, a uh, studio named Frog Song, and they've been spending about 50% of their time making their own games and 50% working for like Saab or, or like working with um, air, airplane uh, simulation um, companies, those kind of things uh, in order to basically fund their game development. So that's part of the reason why we do have those companies. So even in that case, it's not like they do that because that's their business. It's just more that's the way for them to make games. But then we have companies who are 100% doing work for hire and working like business to business and developing game products or gamified services for other companies. But there are very few in our region. I mean, there are examples all over the world, but like what we've seen here, in our part of Sweden, it's just and maybe Sweden in general is just has, I think, seen so much success in like the traditional entertainment type of game development that they haven't there hasn't been a need to explore other opportunities. They, these people mainly are not driven by like entrepreneurship or wanting to build companies, but they want to make the best games. So that's why they don't really uh, get like they're not super interested in, in other opportunities. We have another question in the chat from Ingla. Uh, Olaf, we spoke about a crossover between, for example, games and health, uh, health industry. We have a few companies interested in that and she asked for examples. 
Um, we have a number of uh, it's it's a growing interest uh, and some of the companies here in the, in the region have dabbled in that. The one that comes to mind first at least is a, is a small company called Pow Applications, which has developed um, a, a game for for children that has uh, eating disorders. And uh, we're actually bringing them to to the UK um, later later in the year for another event. But they they started out. Uh, they have done games in the past, and if, if I re if I remember correctly, perhaps you, Peter, know better. But it started out as a way for one of the uh, one of the developers who who is a father have a, have a kid. Uh, who and they couldn't find and they couldn't find any any good solutions to to help their kids eat, mm -hmm. uh, so they did it this themselves uh, because they had they found a need that they had the tools to solve in a way that their kids liked uh, that yeah. coincided with what they're doing. And I, I think that's likely what we're going to see in the next five to ten years as the mm -hmm. industry matures and the developers get kids of their own and and um you know broaden their horizons a bit and maybe getting interested in other areas uh, and that might lead to more of these type of companies surfacing and they they exist it's just that i think just in our particular community it's been it's very much founded in the AAA scene so you have the big AAA studios making star wars and avatar and the division and James Bond and those kind of games, um, and that's the the core. Like the out of our sixteen hundred developers, I think about maybe twelve hundred of them come from AAA, and mm -hmm. the rest are a mix. But it's like that's the oh, the bulk of it, and that that I think has you know uh, influenced a lot of what type of companies we do have here. So even if they leave to start something up, they don't start up a gamification company. It's more that they start up a new game studio. Exactly. Um, that being said, if you have companies in your region that do gamification, I'm sure that we can find a niche for them here in Skåne as well. So, uh, But if have you have look... companies that work with gamification, we have a lot of clients in Skåne. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> From, uh, you know, IKEA and uh, you know, the uh, mobility industry and uh, life science. There's a lot of companies are who are looking for those kind of services and companies. Yeah. I think that will be the final word for the game habitat and the games industry discussion for now. Thank you so much, Peter, for Thank your presentation you. and your time. And I hope to see you soon. In Thank Malta. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. With that, I would like to hand over to Emily Olson from the Food Tech Innovation Network and myself, actually, because I will also be part of this presentation for the food industry, which is one of the areas that we work with as well. Um, but Emily, uh, please take it away, present yourself and uh, who you are and what you do. And uh, we'll, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. So do you want me to run the full presentation before you or you go first? I think you can go first. I think that would be the better better starting position. Yes. All right. Let me just share. So my name is Emily Olson. Uh, I work at a company called Innovation Skåne, which is the regional uh, innovation company for the region of Skåne. Um, our mission is that innovation power from Skåne creates sustainable improvements in the world. And we are doing this within uh, five areas, and I work specifically within the food tech area. And I am the project manager for a project called the Food Tech Innovation Network. This is a project which is run in collaboration with Packbridge, which is a cluster organization for packaging with Lund University, which have a very nice uh, research regarding food technology and Netpart Science Park. Uh, we are doing this project uh, to support SMEs companies uh, to grow. Uh, we are reinforcing innovative solutions and accelerating the growth of SMEs. The whole goal of the project is that these companies will create 150 new jobs 
and not any job, but jobs which is also contributing to the food system of the future. We are uh, working a little bit different than maybe a normal incubator or accelerator. So none of the companies are actually located physically with us, but we're helping them from a distance, let's say. Uh, and we're always focusing on the individual company's unique challenges to accelerate growth. So we do not have any uh, fixed programs or anything like that. However, uh, we can help out with a few things. Uh, we do technical guidance. So you can get maybe, I don't know, it depends what your company needs, but say 10 hours with one of the professors from Lund University to discuss specifics about your product development. We can help out to pay for a pilot run or a scale up or help you find initial production facilities. We do work with growth support and uh, market development. We have um, some collaborations with the region of Skåne regarding public meals and how these companies can, can feed into the public meals of the future. And we work with the community as a whole. At this point, we have well above uh, 90 SME companies in the network. And as I said, to join and uh, take part of, of the support is, is free of charge. Um, yeah, and just to give you a super quick overview on what kind of companies they are, um, they're divided into a couple of sections. So we have a lot of uh, companies focusing on changing food behaviors or new kinds of food. So these are companies like Nista, for example, which is uh, creating whiskey without alcohol or fish without fish, or other kind of new food products from, from uh, different raw materials that we haven't seen before. There is also um, functional food companies, of course, uh, one of them being, for example, Good Idea Drink, which is lowering the response from, from blood, your blood sugar response after a meal. And also Alva Food Tech, uh, which is a company developing products based on the baobab fruit, which have quite a lot of interesting health benefits. Uh, there are companies more focusing on new production processes, of course, and uh, with the larger target on reducing food waste. Here we have, for example, Seveci, which is a company working on mm, replacing the plastics around vegetables. So they have a bio-based film instead of, of plastic for cucumbers, for example. That was a very, yeah, and then we have the digitalization part also. And here we can mention POW again, because there is also a part of this project tapping into the food technology <laughs> in this network. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also companies uh, like Milla, which is a company um, bringing the consumer closer to the actual producer of your food. So this was just a, a very quick overview, overview, but we do have a web page where all of the individual companies are presented. So if you're curious about the companies or, or about, about the project in general, you can just log into there and, and, and have a look around. Um, our, our saying is that together we create the food system of the future, and we do today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, yes, this is this is one of the actors in in the food and the food tech ecosystem that we have here in Skåne. Uh, that's part of Innovation Skåne, of course. Are there any questions for Emily now or otherwise I'll continue with my both overview of the food tech and food industry as a whole? Um, or we can take the questions in the end. I have um, questions. Yep. Probably too, too many of them for now. That that was a wonderful whistle stop tour, Emily. Thank you. And I was hoping to understand what types of products that, that some of the actors are working on or you know what, what the themes are. Perhaps this today is not the day to go into the detail, but I would certainly like to tie in with you to get a, a better understanding of that. It, it looks very interesting indeed. Thank you. Very happy to, to talk further. Thank you.
Um, yeah, just a quick, uh, quick word on that. I mean, there is a lot of different products and uh, everything from basically new ways of putting together old ingredients into into new types of foods, but also new alternative proteins or alternative uh, uh, food sources uh, and reduction of plastic and bio biodegradable plastics and so forth, like like Emily mentioned. So there's definitely a lot of products to discuss and, and talk about there. Uh, Emily, if I can ask you to stop sharing, I'll go into my presentation as well. And uh, there we go. I have a lot of tabs open. I'm sorry about that. Uh, there we go. So back to me, the star of the show, I was about to say, but not not necessarily. Uh, but if, if you do meet me in person, you will realize that I like to talk a lot. So please interrupt whenever you feel that I speak too much. So one of the areas that I work with is the food tech area. So I work quite closely with Emily and Food Tech Innovation Network in order to help bring the companies uh, in in their ecosystem, but also in the other ecosystems to to the market to find uh, suppliers, purchasers, um, retailers, whatever it might be, investors, uh, VC funds, whatever it might be as well. Uh, something I don't think Emily mentioned in her presentation, but Food Tech Innovation Network is actually a, a relatively young organization and having 90 plus uh, organizations in their umbrella by this time is nothing short of amazing, I think. Uh, it feels almost like the food tech companies in the region grow like weeds, but that's not a very good image. It should be more like grains, I guess, uh, but there's a lot of them at least. Um, and when after this presentation, I hope that you will feel that 90 companies is a good start, but there is a lot of potential for, for more. Uh, as I mentioned in my intro, there is something in the soil in Skåne that produces a lot of good food. It is actually one of the most uh, fertile soils in, in all of Europe. And as I mentioned, 30 to 50 percent of, of foodstuffs uh, that is consumed in Sweden actually has their uh, origins in Skåne at some point or another. Um, so this is this is the spectrum that we're dealing with here. Knowledge infrastructure, supporting infrastructure, testbed pilots and pilot production sites, global food companies and innovative companies, of course. Um, I'll go. Uh, through all of these various areas in turn, but I hope that you recognize some of the logos here. Uh, and by the end of this, you will rem uh, remember some of them and some of the smaller ones as well. So the knowledge infrastructure the, that covers the value of the food chain or the value food chain for food development is starts starts in the soil, of course. And for that, we have one of the best places in the world for that, which is the Swedish uh, University of Agricultural Sciences, SLU. Um, this university was actually part, uh, partially responsible for developing the strains of grain that, that was used in the, in the Green Revolution, uh, which is a bit of local history for you. But it's, uh, it's a fantastic place with uh, especially focusing on horticulture, plant production, agriculture and uh, silviculture um, and a few other things as well. Lund University, as uh, Emily mentioned, is a big part of this as well. Uh, they have a faculty for for food industry, uh, which but it also ties into the the tech industry and the pharmaceutical industry, as well as packaging, as we mentioned before. So the the synergies between Lund University and and a lot of the industries in the region are are quite substantial. Uh, Kristianstad University uh, is another part of this. They have uh, another, uh, there's there's an organization called Krinova, which we'll go into a little bit later, which is one of the major nodes for food development uh, for startups in, in Sweden, actually, that's located here in Skåne as well. And Malmö University uh, is big on uh, scientific research and knowledge infrastructure, especially between life science and food. Uh, in the borderlands between those. Uh, supporting infrastructures, uh, food clusters, you've met one of them uh, from Innovation Skåne, Food Tech Innovation Network, but we also have Livsmedels Academy in Klinova and Backbridge. Oh, sounds like we have someone on a train. Um, 
so these these clusters are of course part of this. Uh, Klinova is big on uh, uh, helping companies set up. Some of the companies in the Food Tech Innovation Network are part of the Klinova Incubator and Science Park. Uh, others are part of Packbridge, for instance, which is the packaging cluster organization. Uh, and uh, Livsmedels Akademin uh, is a, a food innovation uh, um, organization on a on a bigger scale, so to say, to, to bring, if there's challenges in the industries as a whole, uh, legislative challenges, for instance, Leafs Metals Academy is one way to, to uh, that can that can act as a, as a lobby organization, so forth, for, for these types of issues. Um, they also partner up with a lot of the larger companies in the area. Uh, continuing on the support infrastructure, uh, the Federation of Swedish Farmers is of course part, in part of this. Food Tech Innovation Network is part of this slide again, um, which shows how important they are, I guess. Um, then we have something that uh, we're coming to with the presentation tomorrow, uh, which is links, Northern Lights on Food. I'll go into that a little bit late, later today as well. But that is one of the programs within the ASS and MAX4 to to look at food development on a microscopic scale or even smaller than microscopic scale, because food is actually one of the most difficult chemical and physi physiological processes that takes place in nature, because there's so many different uh, uh, proteins, um, elements, uh, water, uh, enzymes, acids that go into food production and food breakdown. So it's actually one of the most difficult areas of, uh, of uh, physics, uh, according to the people who work there. So that is quite interesting. Um, but you can't you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, I was about to say. This is not really relevant here, but you have in order to test or find out if food is good or it does good, you have to test it. You have to taste it, you have to test it, you have to test to make it. And uh, this is something that's very, very unique because the new challenges we have with the food industry is that uh, it takes, uh, it's not just about putting seeds in the ground anymore. There, you need you need other things. So these are some of the areas which help with this. So develop uh, open lab score uh, helps to developing an innovative and sustainable and resource efficient food production process. And it's done together with several of the incubators uh, and universities and other uh, institutions in the area, in the region. Um, they do food engineering, material science, chemistry and life science. Food Hills uh, is an is an organization or test bed for circular food production and test site for for both public and private actors in terms of uh, P, uh, the newest or the most uh, most important uh, project that they have at the moment is is uh, a pea protein extraction facility um, to to increase the protein efficiency of protein extraction from peas, for instance. Balls called Food Tech uh, is a, is a very unique uh, ecosystem art because they, um, if you have anything to do with beverages and pastes, uh, food in paste form. And Balsgård Food Tech probably have some of the best knowledge in the world that is readily readily available for other com uh, companies to make use of. They have their partners or behind some of the new uh, developments in drinks that has come out of Skåne and some of the mm, the most prevalent food tech companies in Skåne is actually beverage companies uh, which you can see on the website for Food Tech Innovation Network. Um, they have a lot of specialized technology and knowledge and know-how and how to everything from an idea all the way to a process to drink and then how to make a business around that drink basically. Uh, but they have a lot of knowledge in other areas as well. Uh, Tetra Pak has a test pilot site for packaging uh, or how to yeah, bring uh, sustainable packaging to the food industry. Then we have global food companies. Uh, Oatly is, uh, is perhaps one of the biggest. We mentioned Absolute in the beginning uh, of this uh, presentation as well. They, they are still going strong in Aarhus. Uh, they have started various types of um, 
uh, projects with circularity in, in their waste products, for instance. Um, but we also have Tetra Pak again and Lactalis, which is a huge French dairy company that owns the largest dairy company in southern Sweden. But they also developed the Proviva, which is a probiotic uh, drink uh, that is very good for gut health, for instance. Uh, Oatly is strangely on this slide as well, but uh, here are some innovate. Oh yeah, they're an innovation innovation company as well, but they have been around for a long time. But here are some other drinks that are from Skåne that's making waves. Uh, Sprout um, is is based in Malmo, and they um, they have been competing uh, with Oatly. Their their drink is made from peas. Then we have Vegoglund, who's rebranded themselves a bit with their new product called Dug, um, which is a plant-based uh, drink from potatoes and rapeseed oil to very common uh, plants in, in southern Sweden. And then we have Hjelte, which is perhaps the most uh, controversial of all the drinks here, but it's not really, really con um, controversial uh, when you think about it. But their drink is made from hemp, industrial hemp, not the, the other kind of hemp that has such a bad rep uh, and illegal in a lot of cases. But these are some of the innovative companies, and here are some others. Uh, Nothing Fishy and Good Idea and Lupinta were part of uh, Emily's presentation. Uh, but we do a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things within circularity, waste management, uh, upcycling, and so forth as well. Many of the companies again are on um, Food Tech Innovations website, but also on Krinova's website and so forth. And that takes us to Krinova, funnily enough. So Krinova is an incubator. Uh, sorry, just checking the time. Uh, Krinova is an incubator and a science park primarily for food, health and environmental uh, developments. It's closely related to the College of Krihansta that I mentioned before, and they're the Sweden's largest food related science park and incubator, and they work on a national level to bring uh, to coordinate these uh, these activities, and they have 1500 companies in their network. Um, but they they act as a support for big and small companies and and do consultancies as as well as other things. I uh, mentioned Ball Scored as well, so I won't go too much into these. Uh, but they here are some of the examples of uh, of what they are very good at. For instance, freeze drying, spray drying, fermentation, and so forth. Uh, Packbridge. A few more words about them. Um, basically, if you need something packaged, Packbridge is the place to be. Uh, if it has to do with paper, plastic, or biomaterials, um, they they are big. They are big on all of that. They are of course um, very much supported by uh, Lund University, but also Tetra Pak, uh, Orkla, uh, uh, the big food company, and the region of Skåne is part of this as well. Uh, it's a non-profit membership organization, and as we saw in the other presentation by Emily, it's part of other cluster and networks as well. Um, and Northern Lights on Food, I mentioned briefly before, it's part of the, and the things that is going on at ESS and Max 4, but it's already uh, showing huge, uh, huge influence on a lot of different uh, industries or companies that have an interest in food. Um, IKEA, for instance, is one of the big supporters and backers of this, uh, or not backers, but they're participants as a private uh, private company that has an interest in this. Um, but uh, Emily from uh, from ASS and Max4 tomorrow will tell you more about both this and, and other types of things that you can do. But this is a program specifically focused on on the food industry so you can explore everything from structure of food and raw materials uh, materials structures and in interfaces of proteins uh, of of minerals and and bacteria if you're using uh, fermentation for instance uh, how food interacts with surfaces uh, and and how to keep uh, produce fresh for longer for instance but also on health uh, so it's not limited to this. This is just some of the tracks that they are exploring, and there is a lot of international interest as well as as national interest in these in these areas as well. So in summary, for companies, um, there is a lot to explore within the term uh, within the food industry in Skåne. Uh, 
both for research and collaboration if you want to test a new product or if you want to make a new product uh, there's big science facilities and test beds if you have if you want to try out to make something uh, and how to package it for instance but also to to add something to your existing product either if it's the packaging side or the biochemistry side the microbiome side so forth um, but there is also a lot of uh, money, m monetary interest. So in investors, VCs uh, and other types of groups are looking at Skåne for, for the developments that are going on here. And for investors, there is a very much growing ecosystem for, for, these, uh, for investors to find potentially the next Oatly, uh, potentially the next, next uh, alternative protein source and so forth. And uh, yeah, and then we're back at the end, I was about to say. But thank you so much for listening to the food tech presentation. And uh, if you have any questions for either me or Emily, I think we have a couple of more minutes that we can utilize for that. Thank you. Oops. I have a just one question quickly from me. The, the Park Bridge company seem to be doing very well. And I'm wondering, do they, do they have any environmentally friendly plastic, okay, that's the wrong word, but you know what I'm meaning, plastic type bottles? I don't know their product range. Uh, Emily, you're muted. I, I see that you're excited and trying to speak. <laughs> No, no, I'm just saying that maybe this is, we are not the right people on answering that, but we could give you the contact directly with Packbridge, and um, I know there is people who can can give you the right answers. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting, even things that are more biodegradable than now. Yeah. Clearly, many of us, most of us, certainly I am one of the users of plastic type bottles. You know, I do recirculate them for myself. But for businesses where they are producing products that are grabbing go and disposable, clearly that's not environmentally or eco-friendly at all moving forward. And if somebody's looking at doing something much more favourable than that, then I would be interested to learn about that too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jonathan? Thanks. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation and so many potential points of contact. I don't really know where to start. But one thing that struck me was you have uh, access to a good range of pilot plant facilities. And that's something where we sometimes struggle. So I think some of the companies that we're working with here, it'd be useful to, to have that information and know where that those facilities are available. Mm. Conversely, we do have quite good pilot plant facilities in certain areas ourselves. So it specifically related to things like uh, brewing and distilling, also related to indoor farming, vertical mm. farming. We've got very good access to uh, sort of totally controlled environment growth cabinets for, for growing uh, uh, the, the raw materials in different ways. Uh, so I think there could be some very useful exchanges in terms of where we can sort of share that uh, access to that equipment, because I find that's quite often the limiting factor in getting products to market is going from the from the bench through to something at a larger scale and that sort of intermediate um, uh, <clears throat> sort of scale. The other thing is in terms of where, where we'd be interested in is in terms of raw materials. Uh, we have expertise in berries uh, and have access to a wide range of different berries with different phytochemicals with health benefits. So we're always interested in talking to companies who are interested in developing products based on that and that knowledge. Oatly is a really interesting one because oats are, are a, a good crop in Scotland. Uh, and I don't know if at the moment they use any Scottish oats and looking to, to expand, but that's something that we would be interested in talking to them about, but also using other cereals such as barley, where we do have a, a lot of expertise. So, um, yeah, I think, how, how do we take this to the next step? Because there's just too much to cover in one, one quick question on a webinar, but uh, what would be the next steps to have that more in-depth conversation? 
Uh, a good question. I mean, my uh, our contact information is is available either uh, through the presentations that ha that will be circulated or available after the seminars or the webinars, but also uh, through Ingela and the team uh, at the Chamber of Commerce. So we can we can take it through there. I think that's a good good way to start. And uh, yeah, so we can definitely have separate conversations after this. And I encourage the rest of you, if you're also interested in any of the specific topics, to reach out either to, to the chamber or directly to us, the speakers. Um, uh, you, you can find our contact information on the websites usually, and, uh, and we can take it from there, basically. And also the, the physical visit in September for those that you, you are able, will also hopefully be able to meet some of the actors and interested parties that, that are presenting today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? No. Uh, in that case, I think uh, I will hand over to Laura and Gisim from uh, from Invest in Skåne and or Laura is from the Cleantech Scandinavia, the Cleantech hub here in southern Sweden and Gesim, who is uh, a co-worker of mine who works with uh, advanced materials and Cleantech as well. Uh, uh, so Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, can you hear me well? Yes. Excellent. Okay, I am in the same room as Terry, so you might notice uh, perks of uh, Microsoft Teams. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, Olaf, let me just ask, because I thought that Gazim was going to uh, present before me, or is it after? We have actually not decided on a, uh, ah, okay. when we have double speakers on exactly who goes first, but since I saw your, your face and your name, I, I figured we'll start with Cleantech Scandinavia. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Is there a way that I can um, uh, share my screen, but to continue to see the faces of you? Do you know how, uh, when you presented all of Were you able to I, see the audience? I am not that well versed in um, in Teams, so I don't oh. know exactly actually. So this this is very lonely. So, but okay, uh, sorry. Well, uh, just. Just before you start, so maybe it depends the version of Teams that you've got. So when you're sharing a screen at the top, I get a message that says pop out and that lets me pop out the presentation into a new window and then I still see the people. But I don't know that everybody's version's got that. Mm, yeah, no, anyway, I, I won't take more of the time. Uh, I'll have to to look at that some other time, but it's not very easy to find from my screen. But OK, no further ado. My name is Laura. Uh, I am based in Lund, uh, Skåne as well, south of Sweden, and I'm here representing Clintex Scandinavia. Next slide. OK, so what we do, uh, we connect people, innovations and investments for sustainable growth and agile success. Basically, we are bridging the gap between startups and capital. That could be investors, that could be industries, corporate venture capital. Um, and the how we do this is through several activities that I'm going to talk a little bit about now. First, why the Nordics? Why are we based here? Why do we uh, work in this region? And this you probably know, but the Nordics are always uh, highlighted in the, the top rank of the most innovative countries. So Olaf has highlighted a few of the companies that are unicorns and now are exporting to the world. And there is a reason why Sweden is always in the top rank. Uh, there, there is a lot of policies that influence that. 
and that's why we work focused in the Nordics and more recently Cleantech Scandinavia has also included the Baltics and some might say uh, you can see that hashtag circular circle uh, circling around as uh, the new Nordics. So we have been doing this for 16 years uh, as a, the, the main source of clean tech innovations. And what we do, we run a network of members. So the members are uh, the ones that brings the opportunities, the partnerships, the capital. These are uh, the members that we currently have. So you can after go to our website and, and take a look at them specifically. But we also work with the extended network um, of the clean tech ecosystem. And here I'm saying clean tech, but you can also hear, I don't know uh, too much about each of you, of you uh, backgrounds, but clean tech or green tech, climate tech, sustain tech, those are names that have been, uh, uh, been more recently created and, and uh, updated, but it's our understanding of clean tech are uh, technologies that uh, can promote reduction of carbon emissions. So um, in one end we have the investors and the others we have the startups. The startups, how we find them, we um, uh, uh, very constantly we uh, vacuum the Nordic and the Baltic clean tech uh, startup scene. This is uh, desktop research and also via our network of uh, members and uh, partners. So we look out to who are the new startups that have been created in corners of incubators, accelerators, universities, clusters, etc. And then these startups, uh, they are included in our database and uh, we invite them to participate in our activities. This is our innovation roadmap. So after the innovation sourcing, the startups that we find that are suitable uh, for uh, matching with our members, we uh, actively invite them to apply for our competition called Nordic Clean Tech Open. This year, this competition is going through the 11th uh, year. Unfortunately, uh, this is the, the uh, only Nordic and Baltic startups are eligible. So, um, if you if you ever uh, come to to open a franchise in in uh, in one of the Nordics and Baltics, that could be a possibility. But via that competition, uh, we select um, the the startups and to present to our members. Our members are the jury members, so they uh, evaluate these companies based on their innovation, their market potential, and their team. Uh, after that, since this is focused on early stage startups, so it, it is really a. Uh, uh, an observation tower of trends and innovations to come for our members. Um, after that, we continuously keep contact with the startups and continuously keep uh, supporting uh, on their journey. We do that via, for example, the Clean Tech Geoflow web series. This is an event focused on one of the clean tech verticals that we organize every month. So, for example, the next one in September is going to be about carbon capture, uh, storage and utilization. Uh, we have done uh, smart buildings and energy systems. We have done food tech. We have done um, e-mobility, you name it. Um, this is uh, the online event, but I'll also uh, talk a little bit more about the present events. And the companies that are looking for expansion and perhaps internationalization, uh, we also run an accelerator program. This is just a little bit more about this competition, the Nordic Link Tech Open. These are a few examples of successful startups that came via the Nordic Link Tech Open and now they are pretty much global. Um, in our membership, uh, which is um, uh, comprises a series of products and services to our members, um, we provide an online platform where they can get access to this 
2000 plus Nordic and Baltic clean tech companies. They can see their turnover, profit, number of employees, and also get access to the other content uh, like pitch decks, etc. And for the Nordic Link Tech Open companies, their full application is online. This is a little bit about the Clean Tech Deal Flow web series that I said. It's a monthly event that we organize. We do a lot of uh, events, uh, physical events. Uh, we have a, a, a big arm on the smart city area. Uh, we, um, Clean Tech Scandinavia is the Swedish partner for the Nordic Pavilion. So we are responsible for bringing the Swedish delegation to the Smart City Expo in Barcelona, which is the biggest smart city expo in the world. And we also organize a pre-event uh, um, previous to, to the expo. Apart from that, we have uh, at least two other events uh, per year, uh, being the main one, the, the the flagship event that we organize is the Clean Tech Capital Day, which is going to be in October and coincides with the Nordic Clean Tech Open Finals. We also, uh, to, to support this ecosystem, we also have a big arm on research and business intelligence. So we organize um, two reports a year at least and more depending on what's what's hot. Uh, so the the Nordic and Baltic Link Tech Deal Flow report. Basically, we have been tracking this for ten years plus on the the pace of investments in the clean tech area. And then uh, uh, it, this this is also a, a hot topic, but uh, we we find it's a decisive one for curbing carbon emissions. Uh, so how do we know that our members and our investors are uh, investing in the right companies, the ones that are really going to, you know, um, make a dent. Uh, so we have a department that has been working on uh, impact assessments. It is not uh, something that is being so uh, agreed in the area like GHG protocol or other framework tools that the whole uh, ecosystem agrees that that's going to be the one to use. Uh, impact assessments, there are several frameworks that have been, uh, been used. We have our own, uh, and uh, but it's a combination of uh, several in the market. And we also participate in researching these frameworks and adapting the frameworks because this is a very sensible area. It can lead to double accounting. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to compare uh, data if one company says that avoids 10 giga uh, uh, CO2 and the other five, it, it, you need to look at how they calculate it. So this is uh, something that we we have been studying for two years and uh, this is something that we can provide as uh, consultancy based to startups so you can calculate what would be your avoided emissions uh, but also to investors portfolios and we run several consultancy services apart from the the membership so here, uh, uh, a little bit more about some findings of our work that I think it's, uh, I, I pinned this as a, a potential uh, good information for you to, to have. So this is the, the, the timeline of investments in the Nordic and the Baltic scene uh, in clean tech. As you see, 2021 has gone completely over the roof. 267%. Uh, uh, this is also uh, it's similar with the increase in, in other countries, in other regions. However, we see that this increase has a lot to do with um, uh, the bigger, um, uh, num not number of deals, but uh, deal sizes. So you see many uh, uh, scooter companies and the electrification uh, segment has contributed a lot to this number uh, increase. Um, another thing that we also see is that um, in the past it had had been the 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 behavior is that uh, investors that are based in the Nordics they invest in Nordic companies. 
but because of the the let's say the quality of the startups in the clean tech area and how innovative they are what they offer uh the nordics and the baltics have also been attracting investors from other regions so it has uh, increased um and the, the the tendency is to continue to 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 increase and to uh bring um other other investors we see that especially from our members network the majority are not based in the nordics and the reason for that is that um, because we are the only company that covers the whole region denmark norway sweden finland etc instead of going to uh, each of uh, uh, countries organizations they come to us and we can give a good overview of what's happening in the clean tech area uh, and that they, they want to be close to the Nordics for the reasons that I already said. This is uh, again a little bit more about where are these investors uh, the, coming from, the ones that are investing in the Nordics. And Sweden throughout all this time has been the one that has attracted the most amount of uh, investments. It is, um, uh, uh, especially after 2016, it has been always in the forefront. But as you can see, in from 2020 to 2021, the other countries are, are picking up. Uh, especially uh, Norway has been uh, gr growing in a very rapid pace. This is the investment distribution by country and the number of deals and amount of deals. Again, Sweden uh, much ahead. As I said, there, there has been an increase in larger deals. So this is something that we observed. Um, the, 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 there has not been, for example, deals greater than 100 million before 2019 and 2020, 2021, that, that started to be the reality. This is all, uh, a, a landscape of the investments uh, across funding stages. Perhaps this is an interesting uh, information for the stage that you are to know. Um, it, it is, um, uh, let's say, obvious that later stages companies, they get the most amount of, of deals uh, and, and the amount of investment. But you can also see that the countries that are supporting more uh, seed and, and, and angel and early stage, Finland and Denmark are um, are more in the forefront on that. This is uh, something that uh, is also an, an interesting information that the OECD, uh, OECD has nominated this region from Oslo to Hamburg, and that now that very soon there will be a transport that connects it all. Uh, as uh, a mega region that has the most uh, amount of uh, innovative green companies. And there has been now uh, 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 an organization and specific policies to, to bring this region together and to support green innovation. So um, perhaps this also is a motivation for you to have uh, this region in, in the spotlight. And then here I am going to bring a provocation. Uh, so you probably have heard about the Scandinavian model of uh, gender equality and uh, parental leave for men and women and all of that. And this year for the first time when we were collecting this deal flow data, we wanted to take a look as well. How does that uh, uh, connect to the amount of money that is going? Is it equal? So it is not, and it's actually staggering. The amount of uh, uh, investments that went to companies that have at least one female founder was 6%. So this is something that, uh, at least for us, uh, if, if it's not happening, this 
uh, gender funding equality if it's not happening in the countries that are the model for gender equality then where is so uh, uh, we are of course doing our own homework in Clintech Scandinavia to, to bring more um, women investors uh, for uh, half of the price uh, for free to, to have more gender equal panels and etc. But this is something that has really um, caught our attention and um, uh, I, I would like to, to hear how it is in, in your area as well. And then I said a little bit uh, about the, our flagship event, Clinta Capital Day. So it's going to be in Oslo this year uh, for several uh, uh, reasons. One reason is that we normally do uh, a roadmap uh, since we cover this region, the Nordics and the Baltics. So last year, for example, it was in Malmo and then this year in Oslo, uh, but also because of this new rapid pace of investments in, in Norway. So mark your agendas and how you can get involved with this event. Uh, if you are from the capital side and uh, or uh, potential partnerships or you have something to offer to the startups, you can become a member, you can become a partner. If you have uh, a specific theme that you would like to share uh, in a conference like this, you can become a panelist, a speaker. You can also come to pitch. We're going to have in this event an international uh, um, session. So normally we only invite, as I said, Nordic and, and Baltic companies, but we're going to have one session focused on international companies. So we already have a few uh, US, Canadian, Germ uh, German companies signed up. So if this is interesting for you, please get my email and reach out because I'm selecting the companies right now or share your ideas with me on how you would like to collaborate to, to this event. This is a bit about us uh, again, but more for the slides to be shared after. Um, normally we have, as I said, uh, two main events uh, in the year. The, this first block are events that have already happened in 2022. Um, and now we have these other three events, the Nordic Camp, which is uh, uh, one step of the competition that I mentioned, Nordic Tech Open, to select the companies that will go to the finals, and the finals together with Clinta Capital Day in Oslo and the Smart City series. So if there is uh, any of you focused on that area, please reach out as well. And this is our team. We are a very international team. Uh, Magnus is uh, the, the managing director, the only Swedish uh, there, and the rest of us have uh, come to, to Sweden to study uh, environmental sciences, policies, innovation, etc. And we decided to stay because this is a very fruitful ground to uh, people and companies working with uh, environmental issues. So please reach out. Um, this presentation will be shared with you. My contacts are here and in the website. Um, and uh, happy to hear questions if you have. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, I think uh, we'll wait with the questions until the end if we have the time. Uh, otherwise, if you have questions, please reach out to Laura uh, and Cleantech Scandinavia. Uh, and uh, now I would like to hand over to Gizim Kizeri, uh, who is my colleague here at Invest in Skåne, who will tell you more broadly about what is going on in Skåne, specifically in terms of clean tech and advanced materials. Take it away, Gizim. Uh, thank you, Olof. Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. Uh, I started sharing directly um, yes. and now I can't see you, uh, but uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so my name is Gzim Kiseri. Uh, I'm Olof's colleague uh, here at Invest in Skåne. Uh, I work as business developer with focus on advanced materials uh, and uh, the clean uh, clean tech sectors, with specific focus on energy uh, storage and and sustainable uh, materials. So as a as a natural continuation to Laura's presentation, uh, I will give you. Uh, uh, try to give you an overview of um, of the clean tech sector in the region 
uh, what are our focus areas and what are the businesses that that we work with uh, so as you can imagine uh, we have a, a very ambitious policy framework here in sweden uh, mirroring the overall european union uh, policy ambitions to um, uh, lower carbon emissions and accelerate the green transition. So in line with Sweden's national goal of becoming one of the world's uh, first fossil free nations by 24, uh, 45, uh, the region has also set very high ambitions to become a fossil free region by 2030. And uh, the focus areas are, you can see on the right hand side, everything from climate smart planning to efficient and fossil free homes and properties to um, climate smart uh, agriculture and forestry. So uh, I thought to give you a little bit of um, uh, an overview of our strongholds when it comes to clean tech, uh, and I have divided them into energy segments and environmental segments. So when it comes to the energy segments, uh, our strongholds are within the bioenergy, uh, within the wind, within sustainable construction and sustainable buildings, uh, as well as heating and cooling as a traditional stronghold uh, of our uh, regional industry. When it comes to the environmental segments, uh, we have uh, water uh, management, water purification. We have waste to energy and recycling, uh, as Sweden is at the forefront of some of the recycling uh, solutions, uh, air pollution control and biomaterials. And now I will try and break it down a little more in detail what I mean with uh, all these uh, segments. So what are the subsectors in, in the region that are um, um, as strongholds and that we work with and that is a focus of, of uh, businesses and research here in the region. So energy production and storage, uh, obviously a very high um, on the agenda, a very uh, hot topic uh, where uh, the industry that it attracts most of the investments, uh, one can say, in, in the uh, clean tech area. And when you have seen such high uh, investments in Sweden from uh, Laura's presentation, actually it has to do with, uh, mostly it has to do with energy storage, uh, namely Northvolt and battery technology, battery factories um, in Sweden. So this is also a very um, a, a strong stronghold here in the region. Circular economy, obviously, uh, water management, sustainable mobility, uh, advanced materials, uh, that is the area that uh, I specific, specifically work with, and energy efficiency. And now I will try and break it down uh, furthermore uh, what we mean and what are the areas for each of these energy. So wind, obviously, uh, solar. Uh, we have innovative companies in the region that develop um, next generation solar cells based on nanotechnology, for instance. We have biofuels and biomass. Uh, the majority, for instance, of the regional um, public transportation fleet runs on, on biofuels and biomass. Uh, and then we have storage technology with some of the uh, uh, very advanced uh, solutions uh, coming up now uh, with that are attracting very high interest from international actors. When it comes to the uh, and smart grid, of course, uh, very um uh, interesting area where a lot of companies are coming up with with smart solutions um in in managing the grids in a smarter way and in in a more efficient way circular economy uh, waste management recycling uh, ag tech um, and uh, food tech uh, i will just touch uh, briefly upon uh, ag tech and food tech because scone is uh, the largest region uh, in Sweden that produces food. So all of the around 52% of the food uh, that is produced in Sweden comes from this region. So we have very um, uh, interesting and innovative companies within within ag tech and food tech, everything from uh, new ingredients to new sources of protein, uh, etc. So this is also a very uh, stronghold uh, of the region. Water management, uh, wastewater um, and sustainable water management, uh, efficient water use. Uh, we have a number of companies that are within uh, within the area and we have we host a, a, 
uh, WIN, which is a water innovation network that works to advance research uh, and development of uh, smart water management. Sustainable mo mobility, of course, very high on the agenda. Uh, alternative fuels, um, such as hydrogen and, and fuel cells, uh, smart vehicles, infrastructure and traffic control, uh, and smart fleet management. So we have uh, quite a good number of actors within this area that are working um, to advance the sustainable mobility. Um, uh, advanced materials, of course, uh, one of the regional strongholds. Uh, I will go briefly into uh, uh, a more detailed description of, of our R&D ecosystem uh, when it comes to advanced materials. Um, biodegradable plastics and sustainable packaging, but to be able to reach um, our, our climate target goals, we, we will need some more uh, better uh, materials and better uh, chemistries that will help us uh, to reach those goals. And we are quite strong uh, in, in a number of research areas and we host uh, a number of research facilities that are helping us uh, tackle those uh, great challenges. And of course, uh, energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency buildings, uh, IoT and energy efficiency solutions is very um, high on our political agenda and uh, a lot of companies are working towards those, those kinds of solutions. So this is a vis visualization of, of R&D ecosystem in south of Sweden. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but this is where we sit and this is uh, the bridge uh, and then uh, 20 minutes away we have Copenhagen and then 20 minutes away from Malmo we have the city of Lund where we host two of the world's most advanced uh, research facilities. Uh, this one here is a Max4 laboratory, which is a synchrotron radiation facility, which is the brightest X-ray in the world and it was inaugurated in 2016. And here, 800 meters away from it, we uh, are building the European Spallation Source, which is an electron, a neutron scattering facility um, that will be built and op uh, operational in 2024. Uh, and we believe that once we have these two uh, large scale research facilities up and running, this will be one of the most advanced material science hubs in Europe, if not in the world, where one can uh, develop new materials, uh, everything from better uh, battery materials and chemistries to more lightweight materials to better functional uh, coatings, for instance, that, that one can apply to wind turbines to, to make them more efficient. So, and of course, a lot of research is uh, happening at the uh, world leading uh, uh, faculties uh, at the University of Lund and in Malmo. So this is a very vibrant uh, and um, high tech um, innovation and, and research uh, ecosystem that we host. And this is the reason uh, why you see a lot of uh, innovative companies coming up uh, and attracting uh, such large investments uh, from from different relevant actors. And in conjunction, uh, in uh, connection to this, we have the CleanTech Scandinavia that Laura uh, presented. And within CleanTech Scandinavia, we have the Green Tech Village, uh, which hosts. Which is uh, the idea is to be an accelerator to host the different clean tech companies uh, in one place uh, to foster uh, and facilitate um, uh, a dialogue uh, connections uh, between different actors uh, that can lead to to new businesses that that are not imaginable today um, we also host a, a number of uh, test beds that help with commercialization uh, that aim to optimize energy consumption and, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, I will not go into details um, because we are running out of time, uh, but I will list and this presentation will be available uh, and then we are we will be very happy to introduce you to some of these test beds uh, or to provide uh, more information, uh, how they work, how they can support um, 
or if they have any if you have any any questions how to collaborate with them so everything from a, a, a test bed that works to to eliminate waste and optimize energy and recycling to for instance a nanotechnology pilot production facility um, that can help develop uh, new nanomaterials uh, for different applications. So as, as Laura mentioned, we have a very vibrant uh, clean tech cluster with clean tech Scandinavia, sustainable business hub, uh, innovative companies um, from Alpha Laval uh, with heat exchanges to Elon Road to Orbital Systems who have developed the world's uh, most advanced um, recyclable uh, shower system, uh, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we will be happy to provide more information on any of these companies uh, following this presentation. Uh, and all the other uh, international companies that come to our region are in excellent company. Um, just this is just a, a, an example of, of a number of companies that we have in the region. And what is good to know for you is that we have excellent connections to, to these companies that we can open doors, set up meetings and make introductions uh, should there be a need. Um, I will not touch uh, about the string region uh, since Laura mentioned it, but as you can see, this region is attracting more and more um, uh, interest from, from global players. And what is interesting for you to know that within the string region, there are a number of interact projects uh, that are uh, connecting um, different different ideas and innovations uh, coming up from, for instance, uh, from the Swedish and the Danish side. Uh, we have a number of interact projects where we look at different ways how to further uh, those innovations and collaborations. Uh, and this is also what, something that we could look into together with uh, with your regions. And as you can see, Malmo is in the middle of it, so we are luckily uh, very well placed. Uh, and what I also thought is in interesting for you to, uh, to, to know is that uh, according to FDI intelligence from the Financial Times um, tool the, that we use sometimes to benchmark uh, how we compare to other regions, we have a, we rank very high uh, on experienced industry staff, and this comes primarily from the legacy of global companies that we already have in the region, uh, with Tetra Pak, Herganes, Pestorp. So all the um, international companies that come to our region, they uh, come uh, and have access to excellent uh, competence and highly experienced uh, industry staff. And these are just some of the um, categories that I thought would be um, interesting for you to take with uh, as you think of further collaborations with our region in the future. So industry cluster, patent specialization and experienced industry staff are some of the strongholds when it comes to how we rank with, with, with other regions. Uh, this was all from me uh, since we didn't have much time uh, to uh, go further into detail, but uh, I'm happy to connect with all of you afterwards to, to answer any questions uh, and to see what we could do together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gisim. Uh, yes, and that was the clean tech portion and the last section of this uh, this webinar today. Uh, we're a little bit over time, so I won't keep you if you need to go. Uh, I'll hand over to Alison. I saw that we had a question in the chat. Um, I don't think we have time to go into that because uh, if I'm honest, I don't really understand the question at the moment, but uh, I'm more than happy to explore that question in uh, at a later date, if that is okay, Lorraine. I'll hand over back to you, Alison, and uh, thank you for listening in today. Uh, it's been fantastic to have you here. Thank you to, to everybody. Yeah, that, it's been very interesting, and I think just uh, almost scratching the surface of, of and the opportunity that I think exists between Scotland and uh, our part of the world, certainly, and SCONA, which has been super interesting. Um, 
as um, Olaf has said, we're <laughs> we're here same time tomorrow, um, and we will have some more speakers focusing on some of the other opportunities. But um, ultimately, all of this is, is leading up to us being in Sweden from the 20th to the 22nd of September. Um, so we'd really like to to make sure that we're talking to as many organisations and companies as possible that want to to kind of consider coming along on that visit. Um, and if you can't come with us at that point, then, you know, there's lots of this kind of engagement and interaction we can now do. So the world is a much smaller place now that we all use Zoom and Teams and, and electronic means of having conversations and starting to build relationships. And um, we have recorded the session today and, and it will be available um, on our YouTube channel in due course. And um, Olaf, I think it would be useful for us to maybe be able to get hold of the slides and, and kind of send those on because, so again, there was a lot of detail and, and a huge amount of information there. So um, thank you uh, for taking the time out of your diary to, to come and, and listen and, and look at these opportunities. Huge thank you to our speakers that, that came online from Skona and were able to tell us more about um, all of the information and the opportunities that are there. Lots of similarities, but um, lots of ways I think that we can all um, do work together. So uh, if you're going to join us tomorrow, very much looking forward to seeing you. If you don't get the chance to come on tomorrow, then we will be speaking to, to each of the, the Scottish delegates that were on today and also um, talking to lots of other people about getting involved. So um, we will see you same time tomorrow if you're coming. And if not, um, I hope for to catch up with you at something else. Um, but Olaf uh, and all your colleagues um, from Sweden, thank you very much for taking the time to come on and join us. Thank you, everyone. A pleasure. Thank you so much. See you again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you very much. Bye. bye. Thanks much, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye.